Welcome to High with Cody Brene, a Sex and Humans podcast Easter egg episode. Today we're talking with Cody Brene Cameron at Hey It's Cody with two E's, an actress, motorcycle rider, stunt woman, and entrepreneur. Cody has a charity ride for Wagmore Pets, where she will be riding along Route 66 from Los Angeles to Chicago. It will air on YouTube at Hey It's Cody 2, and that's the number. Cody, I have known you for almost 13 years, that's right? That's crazy, yeah. Yeah, that's kind of wild. Um, I mean, you know, the, when we first met, how far we both come and the, the, the context of like our lives and our understanding and our adventures, you know, and uh, I think I, I've always, you know, this isn't the first time I'm telling you this, you know, I've always kind of admired how, you, you know, you, you, you navigated your own life and, you, you know, resisted any kind of uh, traditional path, but not, it didn't feel like it was resisted specifically out of the interest of being contrarian, although uh, it probably had something to do with it. Um, you know, but it wasn't, it wasn't specifically like a rebellious thing it, where you would eventually fall back into what you were expected to be and who you were expected to you know, turn into um, by either society or your parents or whomever. And so, you know, I think your, your experience has really been interesting to kind of watch from, you know, the, my point of view, you know, the, 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 the twists and the turns to where you are now. And that's, you know, making films that you can't talk about because the actors are on strike, you know, <laughs> uh doing stunt woman things riding across country for charities for you know both pets and motorcycles i mean you know it's 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 interesting i feel like there are a few people that i know that are making their own choices and living a life that they're kind of intending and designing versus just trying not to die mm -hmm. yeah absolutely <laughs> When I so <laughs> when I met you, I was such a hot mess express. I was fresh out of the car from a small Midwest conservative city, and I'd never been out west before. And I think I met you in like the first three months, and I was just like in culture shock, and um, you know, twenty two, and thought I knew everything and didn't know a thing. So, <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, that's I mean, that's the nature of being twenty two sometimes, but. You know, you, you've really come a long way. You, you've seen so many different things, you know, and being moving to the world as a, you know, an attractive woman in Hollywood has its, its double edged sword, I would imagine, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and different aspects. And so, you know, one of the things that I'm, I'm really interested in is this new understanding of masculinity and femininity and looking at how our points of view on those two words shaped our future, our past um, and, and potentially for good reason, right? Hunter gatherer type of scenario, like masculine, the male, like masculine had a fit with the male because the male was going to you know, rip the beast apart and kill it. And, you know, the feminine fit with the female because you know, she had no choice, but to give birth. I mean, that was literally her biological imperative. And now that that's faded, I think that's why we're starting to see a more infiltration of our population by people that have a wide understanding of those terms, masculine and femininity. And, and they're starting to divide up where gender, sex, you know, masculine, feminine aren't all kind of synonymous words that are interchangeable at all. You know, it's it's all it's all a mash of of different expressions. You could have a very masculine straight woman or a very feminine straight man or any of the other combinations. And and it's interesting to me what you think of those things. So let's start off with uh, what, what do you think of masculinity and femininity? Well, I would say that 
you know, my ideas shaped by childhood, which again, growing up in the Midwest is very like the man works and he's the breadwinner and the woman stays at home and cooks and cleans, um, has the kids. And then everyone goes to church and has this perfect cookie cutter kind of life. And, um, I never saw myself in that. And, um, I would say that I, uh, I'm like tiny and cute, so like dainty and feminine in that way, but I like to do <laughs> the tomboy things. Like I've always liked to climb the trees yeah. and play the sports and ride the motorcycles and um and so yeah, I mean as a kid, people kind of think that stuff is weird. Like if you don't I don't want to play with Barbies or well, I want to make my Darbies Barbies do dirty things, but that's another conversation. I want to like I want to go <laughs> like I liked mowing the lawn. I didn't like doing the dishes, you know, and, and that makes you kind of a little of an outcast in, in a place where things are very defined by gender norms. Um, whereas in LA, things are quite less defined. Like I was driving down um, Hollywood Boulevard and there's a big billboard for the show called Pea Valley. And um, it's quite eye-catching because it's a African-American man with like pink hair so it looks like a female in that way, but then has a beard. So male in that way, and then long fingernails and this fan. And um, I just think about like, every time I pass that billboard, I'm like, if my dad saw this, he would freak out, you know? And it's like, it's crazy <laughs> that a picture can evoke such an emotion from somebody because they've been trained their whole life to be a certain way. Like I come from a military family. So it's like the men go into the military. And, um, you know, we don't talk about our feelings and all that stuff. So to, to see something that they don't understand, like creates a lot of fear for them. So then it reverts back to like, things must be a certain way. Um, so that's, that's my beginning thoughts on it. So what do you think is, uh, where do you think masculinity is at this point, given, you know, all of your different experiences with men and women who were masculine, right? Uh, because I would argue masculinity is not related to biological sex. Mm -hmm. It's just been uh, idealized in a singular version of that. And we did that for a long time, and now that's being challenged. But what would you say as somebody that, you know, is you know, I've never dated men who has seen it from the masculine, seen the masculine from the female side. And while I, you do ride a lot of motorcycles, you know, you, you have a very feminine nature to yourself. So how, how have you interpreted that? Like, has it changed? Has you, have you seen in the last 13 years go from one thing to the, to another? Well, I think, it's funny, as you're asking me the question, I think, okay, when I think of masculinity, I think of powerful. And then I was like, well, wait a second, femininity is really powerful too, but in two very different ways. Like to me, masculinity is um, maybe more like like brute force, like sh like physical strength, whereas feminine power is more like a soft and like manipulative has a negative connotation to it, but you know, like um, a little bit more like with your brain power. Um, hmm. I think that's okay. kind of interesting. So, no, that's interesting. It's uh, So where do you think are the links, if any, between uh, the way that you think or do things, right? And if you're going to say masculinity is about doing something and femininity is about thinking about how to do something potentially, if I, if I can surmise that. Mm -hmm. Um, what do you think is changing with that or what do you, or is it not? Well, I think you know, the first thing that, that comes to mind is that men, especially in LA are encouraged to talk about their feelings a lot more. Um, you know, cause I think we associate communication with femininity and again, that kind of brute force, like closed offness, like must protect the family with masculinity. And so I love that about LA. And I think that's a very, healing healthy thing to get blended that you know our, that our idea of talking about our feelings isn't tied with just being feminine or just being girly um 
And then uh, on the physical side, I feel like the whole like metrosexual thing in LA, it's like guys can actually take care of themselves. Like I have friends that go and get manicures like every other week that are dudes. (laughs) And now in LA, we have places that are specifically for guys. There's a place called Hammer and Nails where it's like dudes only go get your nails done, you know, and um, and that's I think that's a movement you know, that's coming of more blending that like, that's okay. And I know a lot more females getting into motorcycles and welding and things that were traditionally considered manly. Um, But there's also still, a, you know, as much as we're trying and people are more open-minded, there still is a huge stigma around it, you know, that you run into. Um, I get told all the time on the internet, especially Reddit, oh, the Reddit incels really like to come for me. But, you know, I just post a picture with me and my bike <laughs> and no matter what I – I post without without me. It's just my motorcycle, which has pink flames on it, which to me seems feminine. Um, but I'll get guys commenting like, hey, bro, sick bike, you know, because they think it's a dude. Um, but if I post with my bike, if I'm wearing clothes, the comments are always about like taking more clothes off, like being sluttier. And then if I'm wearing like a bikini – their hate comments about how I just want attention and I don't actually ride. And so the comments are never about the motorcycle. If I'm in the picture, it's always about me. But if you take me out of it, then the comments about the motorcycle and it's assumed that I am a male, Mm. which is fascinating. I mean, that's interesting because, you know, you post and you, you, you have a, a, a business around that, that you, that you market towards a very, I guess, specific kind of male. I mean, do you think that's true? Do you think there's a, a specificity or a, a target demographic, if you will, of like the people on Reddit that are commenting? Oh, for sure. And then even just men that ride motorcycles, again, are kind of a very specific kind of male. Um, probably not the males that are going to the nail salon. You know, there's probably very few intersectional people getting their nails, men getting their nails done and riding motorcycles. But um, I guess that would just be me. (laughs) Yeah. My fingernails and one of the few, one of the motorcycle for a long time. I know, one of the few. Yeah. Um, Um, And even then, just just elaborating on this idea of like uh, in the motorcycle community, there are bikes that are considered feminine bikes. Like I have a Sportster, so it's an 883. And so that's um, on the, the middle size of an engine, whereas like, you know, people have a 1200 or whatever. And so uh, there's a lot of like flack for men that ride Sportsters. Or I think you had a Honda Rebel, right? People love to just hate, At one point, hate yeah. on men with smaller bikes, which is so funny because – a lot of people in the motorcycle community are also just like, hey, if you're on two wheels, like you're part of the, the crew. And then there's the the machismo motorcycle riders who are like, oh, no, if it's not a road glide Harley, then like you're a pussy. So <laughs> where do you think that comes from, though? I mean, I think that's changing. My guess is most of those guys are older. For sure. Uh, right? Yeah, for sure. And it, 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 you know, there, there was an identity there. There was a, um, I think there was a, an aspect of rebellious identity that they ex- experienced and it was put into an, a misunderstood hierarchy, right? Whether that be the size of your bike or, you know, how tough you were or whatever it was. And, you know, that's how they established their hierarchy, which is actually super primitive, right? I mean, you can watch Chimp Empire on Netflix and it's like, oh yeah, that looks really similar. And, you know, th- this idea that like the biggest and the strongest should be absolutely the alpha leader. And it's just, it's fascinating to me because I, you know, right now in the in the sports world of silliness, I guess Elon Musk is proposing to fight Mark mm-hmm. Zuckerberg, which is, is so, so close to idiocracy. I know. <laughs> we're, we're, we're like, we're like a hair's breadth away from watering our fucking but plants our with Gatorade. Te- our, everybody's um, all about just the clickbait, right? Like the immediate satisfaction of something ridiculous and then churning up so much discussion over it um, to generate the, like, right. Who the, 
the person who's making it all happen is is profiting from it somehow, right? Or getting more clicks and likes that mm -hmm. you know equals money in some way. Um, so, but yes, that's. But 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 what do you? Th I think they're playing on, you know, this changing idea of masculinity and femininity, right? I mean, neither one, Elon Musk nor Mark Zuckerberg, would you ever be like, it's going to be okay because they're in the room and the bad guy's not coming through that mm. door with him inside. Like, neither one of those are those dudes, right? Like, um, and yet at the same time, here they are, whether it's whatever their strategy is from a brand point of view. Uh, or a marketing money point of view, they, they're choosing to market themselves with this kind of plea for validity by being tough, right? Like as if they're, because they're not tough guys, then their billions of dollars doesn't mean as much, right? If they can't mm -hmm. fight or something. Um, and, and, and I find that really interesting, especially, I find it really out of touch as well for what I think what's coming right. And, and this, this notion that, you know, human beings are, their emotions are starting to balance. Right. And I think men and women both had, that's what I mean. Like, I think femininity is this, it's not a feminine trait. It's just somebody had to be feminine and it was easier for us as human beings to like divvy up the workload. And so men were like, well, like I'll carry the shit cause you know, I'm stronger than you. Um, and I'll go off and I'll do those things. The women were like, yeah. And I, I'm literally forced to carry a child. So I, I can't go off and do shit. So I'm going to stay here and keep our place safe so that when you come back, there's somewhere to be. And I think that was really biologically imperative. And, you know, we, we relate masculinity and femininity to sexuality, but like, I don't think there's a connection, but do you, do you think there's a connection between those two, those three words? Like the more feminine art you are, the more likely your sexuality will look like X. Uh, I would say that, in my sexual experience as a woman who dates men, like the, yeah, I, I would say that men that, that seem like they're tougher or more masculine in the bedroom than tend to be like more dominant and like are afraid of butt stuff, you know, like things that we associated <laughs> with. Like, I think that's another really crazy, like, um, like I think pegging and like ass play for men is like a lot more common now where it, that would have been so shunned, you know, 15 years ago, or especially, you know, we've eliminated certain words from our uh, vocabulary. I mean, not everybody, but you know, we don't call things gay anymore. Like, Oh, that's gay, bro. Um, right. So uh, yeah, I feel like part of the shift too is that men are like more open to sexual experiences that were considered not okay for masculine men or whatever. But, um, but yeah, I do feel like if somebody presents a certain way, then in the bedroom, it tends to be that way. Whereas more, the more feminine guys I know tend to be like better lovers in a way that are more like emotional and caring and communicative and just kind of like open. Do you think that it has something to do with their, sexuality preference um, not ness their sexuality preference like do you think you find that you know the more the tougher the guy the the less likely or the, you know the tougher he presents the less likely he'll be gay from your point of view and experience or and like you know a guy who's soft and spoken you know he you're like, oh, wow, you're straight. You really only like... Mm, I I, I'm just yeah, asking. Yeah, Because I don't have a woman's point I of view. I feel like guys that present really tough... Um, oh, I feel like they're so closed off to their emotions, which is why you're getting that kind of toughness. 
um, because it's a wall. So under all that stuff, like, are they just as likely to be gay? I I think totally. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like, what do you? What would you define as like uh, healthy masculine then? Healthy masculine. Because th- that sounds like a whole bunch of, uh, you know, homophobia slash, um, you know, that's being expressed as like toughness, but that's really probably just masking and covering up certain traumas. Mm-hmm. But like, so what's the, what, what do you think is this version of healthy masculine? Uh, well, I think healthy masculinity, I, I think it's natural to want to like take care of people um, or take care of your partner and and that can show up in different ways. Like if you love, if you want to go to the gym to get big, you know, so you can, again, this idea of like protection, like that's fine and everything. Um, to me, healthy masculinity is also like being a gentleman, like opening the door. Um, you know, like if I had a, I mean, I can change my own tire, but if I had a flat tire, like knowing that I could call a masculine friend and they would come like help me, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. Like I think of healthy masculinity of like being able to call somebody that could take care of like a, something like physical, whereas like, I guess healthy femininity maybe is like, again, more emotional. I guess that's what I keep equating it to. So let's, do you, do you think it's possible to separate masculinity from male and femininity from female? Yeah, definitely. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, but like in a way that is still, uh, that, that keeps everything separate where it's, it's like, you know, you can't, you know, if you have a, a feminine male, like, do you think you would ever be attracted to a feminine male? Yeah. I'd say I'm like more attracted to feminine males. Interesting. Why do you think that is? I mean, just yeah, um, uh, it's a, maybe a loaded question. Well, I, I feel like as a, that's what I look for in a partner, like somebody who can have like a really deep conversation with me. Um, obviously I still love, like, I love blue collar and, you know, automotive stuff. Um, but I just really need the like emotional connection. And so I find that I get that a lot more with feminine males and again like um like vulnerability and open-heartedness and communication and those all come just comes more with like a feminine male interesting i like that um and what behavior like what what, what's the behavior that 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 sets it off from your well, point of view, like, how do you spot Yeah, it? I also want to add physically, like, because I, I'm i more attracted to, like, a feminine body type on a male, like, slim, um, like, Asian, as opposed to, like, super built and muscular. Um, and I don't know if that is from – I feel like I've always been that way. And, again, maybe because the my first celebrity crush was on – Jacob Brent, who played Mr. Mistopheles in Cats the Musical. So <laughs> I think uh, just sh- that was just what I was drawn to as a kid. And so then you see that like play out as an adult. And then, you know, the first guy that I dated that was a bodybuilder was just a fucking garbage human, you know? So you're like, okay, the more experiences you have, where you're like, hey, this goes here, this goes here, got it. Um, uh, but yeah, what was the next question? <laughs> Sorry, I wanted to throw that in. <laughs> oh no, it's it's fine. Yeah, I, I, I'm just curious because you know that you as when we when I chat with w- women, uh, it's it's really interesting to hear their point of view from guys. I think you know what you what we get through a lot is uh, you know online, especially or really myopic point of views or singular point of views that say like women do this, or conversely, men are this, mm-hmm. and. And I think that's because, in part, it's our own lack of empathy as a culture and as a society. It, it's the complete inability to realize that humans are this and humans do shit like that. Uh, it's just when you have those podcasts or those other TikToks or whatever it is, you know, they're, they're looking at it very specifically from their point of view. Like, I'm a man. Let's talk about why women suck. Or vice versa, for sure, right? For sure. 
Ugh. Men are the worst because all they do and want is X. And th- there's there's truth to it because that's their point of view. Right? They can see it. They can see the self the evidence in, in the their self experiences. But everybody has those. But I think men have those about women in you know the cis straight community. And women have those about men. And then we forget that we're all having the same experience as human beings kind of develop. And I think women are coming at this thing from a feminine point of view and reaching into their masculine, whether that be being self-sufficient, not relying on a man to work and earn capital to provide for themselves. You know, they're riding motorcycles. They're, they're, They're doing things that, yeah, traditionally was sent for the male to do. And men, conversely, are are getting into the the feelings game, to your Mm -hmm. point, right? They're getting vulnerable. And and it's because we're not forced to survive anymore. And so men, like I've I've said this before, but, you know, 50, 100 years ago, I don't think it was uncommon for a man of my age to at least have known one partner and at least one or more children that like just didn't make it and just died. Right. Either in childbirth when they were like three or some crazy shit like that. And then maybe my partner and my kid died in childbirth. And it's like, I can't break down and lose my mind like we do today. And, and maybe it's healthier to lose your mind for a minute, right? You grow and you, but we couldn't do that. Like I had to keep functioning. I had to keep surviving and I had to find somebody else to try and procreate the species because that was built into our culture and like both procreate and this value of your own lineage. And even though most of us are not not worth making more than <laughs> um <laughs> right so uh, and, and that and that, that's a big part of it right so it's men really it's only been a couple of generations where we've had the freedom and the the ability to have the time to have feelings and be vulnerable yeah. I, it wasn't allowed yeah and i think on the the flip side of that with females is we like didn't have the ability to make a lot of money to support a man or the family or whatever because of those gender roles. So it's not like as soon as women were allowed to go work that all of a sudden we were supporting everybody, right? Cause it takes time. But now I know so many, mm-hmm. I know again, I know that I'm in a bubble in LA and it's not the same everywhere, like in Southern Illinois, but I know a lot of women who support their men now um, because of the the shift in wealth, the ability to, you know, like OnlyFans, for example, whereas before like a, a girl would have to like, you know, be a waitress or something like now there's just access to all this money um, changing hands. And then if you're an entrepreneur, getting your hands on that money, you can invest it. You have the resources. Like it's not like you had to go to MIT to watch a YouTube video to learn how to invest, you know, and all of a sudden there's this ability to make money where there was no ability before. And so now it's like, well, I want a guy to just stay at home and clean and cook for me and take care of the dogs. And like, I'm going to go earn and he can chill. Um, which I think, or, you know, or girls are complaining about it, right? Like, Oh, guys don't want to work anymore or whatever the case is. But I think, I think even 10 years ago, like it did not exist in the same way that it does now. Do you think human beings are designed for partnership or do you think there is a world where partnership doesn't exist? Well, I don't like, healthily. yeah, I don't really believe in monogamy. I don't think that humans are hardwired to be monogamous, right? Like men are supposed to spread their seed. And like you said, we're, you know, we're, genetically hardwired a certain way because we're animals just like everybody else um so i think that but i also think that we are pack animals so i don't think we're meant to all just live in our single studios and have our cars and drive to work and sleep and die like i think we're supposed to be like a community-based 
group and that I think is the healthiest way to live. Like we help each other out. Um, but I think that it's natural to spend some time with a partner and then especially with all the things available to us now, like traveling and, and learning new opportunities or, or moving somewhere for a job or school or whatever it is an experience. It, it doesn't make sense to stay with that same person for 60 years I and mean, how much changes, you know? Mm-hmm. I know you don't have kids either. Um, what do you think, what do you think would change for you if you had to have that responsibility, that accountability? I think that would probably change my position a lot, huh? Because I don't be stuck with no kid by myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I guess maybe that's, you know, so many things that humans do are so fear-based in an unhealthy way, right? So I think if I had a kid, I would really want to know that that partner was going to be there to raise that kid with me. Um, but mm -hmm. I guess there's no guarantees, right? I mean, even, you know, marriage is just a piece of paper that people rip up all the time. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, well, I think it's, it's, and then again, that was all part of culture. I, I think that's part of the culture that's changing, right? This concept of what marriage really was and, and really what it was was a, a contract that, you know, they presented before God, but what they really were doing was presenting it in front of a civil mm -hmm. court that said, you, man, take financial responsibility for this woman because she can't do anything herself and we need women to make more babies. So you're responsible for her. And then the, the privilege of divorce and alimony and the way that was all originally structured, which is now it's just a chaos of vengeance usually. But, you know, it's uh, like now it's, that was all designed like, hey, if you can afford to take care of the first woman that you said you were going to take care of for life and another woman, well then, sir, I grant you a divorce, <laughs> right? Like that was it, right? And, and then you could, you could do that as many times as you could afford. You could have as many women as you could afford to have. Those women just usually didn't let you come back, come back to the bed after you left it for somebody else. But that was also social, right? That was cultural that, you know, somehow we were, we were supposed to be offended by that. Um, and, and there was a right and a wrong way to act. And I think, you know, a lot of that's changing, but you know, I don't see, you know, I interact with men very differently than you do. You know, when I interact with men, they get super honest because they, they feel comfortable in the, the experience, uh, they feel safe. And so, like, you know, they can have, well, this is what I really think about what's happening, or this is what I see in my dating life, right? This is what I see in my marriage. This is what I see in my kid's school. And, you know, there's all sorts of different stories from listening to a friend of mine complain about the fact that in England, there are children that are pretending to be cats and somehow they're being forced to accommodate that in some way. And she doesn't understand. And she's a super progressive woman, but she's like, I don't, I don't understand the cat. And then, you know, and whereas that I think is, I think is potentially a rebellion or, a, or, a, or a mockery of the change that's happening. You know, it's, it's, it's an example of, what can be what is ridiculous and what is not when you're starting to redefine things in a way that many see as ridiculous or gay yeah you know? and you're like yeah we don't you know that's the we, we were to your point it's like we've moved on from that but some people haven't and and they just they still get very afraid and very threatened by that um and they they really have a hard time looking themselves in the mirror and saying like who am I? Right. What is it? Where is that self-awareness? Um, so online, I'm curious in like Reddit and those things, when, how do you, how do you take that? How do you respond? Do you respond? Do you just, is it just something that you gloss over? You like, what's your experience? What's your interaction? Um, and how does it affect you? I've learned to 
Well, first of all, I'm like very lucky that I have a hugely supportive fan base. Um, really, Reddit is kind of on the newer end to me, so I feel like I'm figuring it out, and so that's why I've had like the people come for me. Um, but overall, my fans are super awesome. But of course, there are the people on OnlyFans too. People will come in there and be like, "Why the, you know, why would I pay five dollars for this thing? You're a hideous, ugly, self indulgent monster, or whatever they want to say." Um, and I, I mean, I've been, I've been dealing with it for so long that it just ducks off a water's back or whatever, wait, water off a duck's back. Um, but I mean, there are times when you are feeling, uh, there are definitely times where I feel lonely or sad and I go to the internet to help that, whether it's for entertainment or whether I start reading comments or I like google myself to feel a little good you know like oh look at this really nice article someone wrote but um (laughs) so there are times where i i read i go down this um rabbit hole of reading things and i'm like wow is that like obviously it it hurts you know if you read 10 things in a row that are super negative about yourself i think it's hard to just be like oh well fuck them you know um so there was a time where on reddit i would just respond like well, you're going to hate me no matter what i post so i'm going to post whatever the fuck i want and that was like empowering to me to say and then I just learned to, like, like if the Reddit crew isn't where I post pictures of me and my motorcycle, great. We're just, we're just going to post the motorcycle. Um, we're just kind of, like, learning what to post and where. Um, because I don't like putting myself out there in a way where I know it's going to attract that negative attention. Because it's, like, I think people could say, like, just don't read the comments. But you have to, to, like, interact. It's just kind of just part of growing the social media so sure i've just learned to tailor what i'm posting in certain ways whereas in other ways right i'm just like i'm gonna post what i want because that's who i am and that represents me but to me it's like if if posting in a bikini on a motorcycle like it's going to be dangerous for my mental health on reddit then i just i won't do it that's fine i don't need to do that so i want to ask you a question and I want to I want to make a parable story to see what you what your point of view of this. So I started um I started I was a scuba diver. I, about about the time I met you, I was learning to scuba dive and then I became an instructor. And that kind of happened by accident. Suddenly I was teaching diving and I only started diving because I loved it and I I I went underwater. I was like it's the most amazing thing I've ever ever done. I, I can't wait to do more of this and how can, it's expensive as shit. I didn't have any money really at that point. So I was like, how can I make this work? Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll be a dive master. And so it was that, but then I became an instructor and I probably shouldn't, but I was a little manipulated into that. And I taught 26 people how to dive. I probably hated it for 22 of them. And, uh, and then I was done and I stopped diving for a while and then I came back to it. And I can still find the that that joy is still somewhere, but honestly, every other time I've gotten in the water, this this sense of responsibility, accountability of work, just comes in, and I'm, I'm like, "Where's the other guy? What's going on?" And I'm just working the whole time, and I feel that responsibility of like, "Hey, John David is a you know scuba instructor, so." he'll definitely be able to take care of everything that's happening. And like, he's, he's got it. And so it just feels like work. And so somehow this pleasure of mine became work. Do you, do you think that's possible? Do you ever feel that in your, like, as an only fans? Yeah. Like, is that something that kicks definitely. in? Definitely. I mean, after doing it for like, I've been doing it for three years, posting every single day, multiple times a day. Like there are days well. where you're like, I would rather clean toilets, honestly. But um, but there, but for the most part, I mean, I really enjoy it. And I think you're just constantly redefining why you like it, right? Like at first it's like, oh my God, I get all this attention. This is so fun. And like, oh my God, money. And then you're like, I had this really great conversation with this guy and I feel like I like made his night better, you know, or like, or whatever it is. Or you're like, now I'm like, I've curated this entire shoot myself. I hired wardrobe and makeup and I got a location and I hired a videographer and, I, and it involved motorcycles. You know, in the beginning I was like, I'm taking cute bikini pics. And now I'm like, I'm incorporating my passions. I'm 
seeing him playing guitar like in a bikini like naked to sell on OnlyFans or whatever it is like things that actually like bring me joy but like uh, you know that's work like that you have to keep finding and digging because whatever it is is going to you know the ebbs and flow of it um, and I also wanted to point out real quick because I know people are like well stop posting if it bothers you or whatever but it's like this is what I do for a living like I do love it at the end of the day like I love it and like I love it when people are like if you like if you if you don't if you're gonna complain about it then don't do it but it's like I'm like I make a shit ton of money doing it so yeah I am gonna keep posting because that is my job like if a lawyer is like I oh my god I had a bad day you're not like you should quit your job and rethink your life you're like okay you know so I just think content creators sometimes get like shit on a little bit where it's like well why don't you do something else then it's like well no this is my chosen profession and I love it but as we're having a conversation I'm gonna like bring up things that you know are in the negative sometimes right it's not all positive i guess i I, i'm curious on whether or not i'm curious what the cultural implication of it it all is going to potentially be right like without judgment one way or the other you know they're like social media you know nobody judged that at all and you're just like this is great we're going to do with it what we've always done with all technology and that was embrace it 100 percent with open arms and you know the fact that it, it proved itself to not be so healthy for people uh, does not stop us from doing exactly the same thing with AI, which is going to be, you know, a thousand X more changing. Yeah. But like, but like looking at how, you know, the statistics on social media and increase in teenage girl suicide and, you know, increase in depression amongst like Gen Z that is using social media as a, source of social validation right almost in like i I don't know i I, i'm not old enough to know what it would have been like to even consider what it would have been like to been online bullied Mm -hmm. as a high school kid i definitely had my fair share of bullying to me not by me i was really little when i was in high school um even though I, i played a sport you know, I was just really little and I looked really young and, you know, it was difficult, but I can't, when I, you know, whenever I went home, I was always free from that. And to know that that could follow you home or that somehow you might have to like deal with your mom or your dad knowing that you're basically getting bullied, which is humiliating. Um, online like these types of things that we know exist that are really affecting culture negatively we're not really changing them so i guess another question would be like how if if it became clear that you know it was not healthy for you what would would it affect you at all um like how like what would it have to say like smoking like people like how long was smoking bad for you fucking decades before people were like you really should stop Um, I think I, I'm not saying that it is. I'm curious, like where, where, where's the line? I think that all content creators who do it for a living go through these periods of needing a break. Um, the crazy thing about our jobs too, is that there can always be more, you know, I think in a, a more regular job, whatever that means, but you know, there's kind of like, I did all the work for today. Like we can shut our brains up. Like I can always be online. I can always be coming up, churning out ideas and making content and making more money and that like feed or getting more attention or whatever it is, it's like feeding your ego or hopefully feeding your soul more. But, um, but yeah, I definitely have to be like, okay, today we're putting the phone down and taking a break. And I get, I've noticed this actually this week particularly bad because I am planning this project and I'm just like, have all these sponsors e- emails and all these ideas and I'm, I have a YouTube editor and we're churning out videos. And I'm just like, when I set my phone down, I went and saw a movie And I was like, I wanted to leave the theater so I could get on my phone. Like it was so bad. And I was like, okay, we need to do like a little break cleanse kind of thing. And I have to set boundaries for myself. Um, But I think another huge cultural implication is that we're churning out these, like I go to these content houses with these girls and guys that are like 21 years old, never had a real job, like have 
their social skills are just so lacking because everything is through the phone. Like I have this girl that will not talk to me in person, but she like will like all my stuff and message me and is so sweet there. But I, I see her in person. It's like she doesn't she doesn't even know how to like interact with me. Like they don't, um, uh, they don't like parallel. It's so crazy, but I'm just so worried that, I I mean, I, I feel bad for them because I worked at McDonald's when I was 16. I know what it's like to have to work for $3 an hour and it makes me appreciate everything I have. And, and I have these skills that for whatever reason, if like the internet collapsed, like I would survive, but these kids, you know, they, all they know how to do is make videos. And again, like, they're not like charity videos. They're like, how can I do the dumbest shit to get clickbait, like eating Tide Pods or whatever, you know? And I feel like mm-hmm. what happens when those people become parents or, you know, like, I don't know. It's just, I feel so bad for them because I, I just don't envy the way that they've been raised and what they value and their skill sets. The same could probably be said for you and the boomers. So do you think it's actually a negative trajectory or just, I mean, I kind of agree with you. I worry about, I think there's potentially going to be different segments of our population and some of them are going to live online. You know, like I think relationships could end up online. I I think, you know, not everybody is hot like yourself and can't socialize. Right. And there's probably a lot of women that would like to be engaged into the world like you are. Um, and they, they can't do that because of the way that their body is designed. They're just, they're not treated that way, but online, maybe they could be. And I, and I've always wondered like, you know, would it be a bad thing if, you know, a person that just, is not a very physically attractive person just and, and 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 that's just objective and like you can be nice about it but when they go into a bar like no one is going to interact with them from a point of view of being like i think i'd like to see you naked man or woman do you know what i mean like those people exist and and you know pretend that they don't is is, is a little silly and so would those people be happier online? What if they could be online and look like you? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, And, and what if he could look, you know, like a hot celebrity and they could actually have a conversation and, and hang out together and maybe in some sort of VR space and there they don't have to deal with things. I mean, you could even interact physically via the internet that that technology already exists it's just not very mainstream um i'm sure you know you're aware of stuff Mm -hmm. like that right the like even partner things i think that um yeah uh so i'm watching uh this is my guilty pleasure uh 90 day fiance before the 90 days and it's when the americans (laughs) you know they've been online dating from facebook these these like people in spain or the middle east or wherever and they go to meet them and it's a disaster, obviously, because they've all been lying and using fake photos and in varying degrees where some you're like, okay, yeah, I mean, that has a filter, but we're close, you know? Um, and obviously there's so much conflict when they actually meet and they've just convinced themselves, one, that the, the person that they're meeting is a completely different person than they really are, and two, that, and then they wonder why, but then they're doing the same thing and there's absolutely no um awareness about it you know like she's like oh, i'm so nervous he's lying of course he's lying because you're lying about everything and and then so like yes for the six months that they were chatting online do they get those same like yeah you get a winky face and you get a dopamine release like absolutely but i think it's like drugs and alcohol where you're like oh yeah for the short term fuck yeah let's get fucked up and for six months it's gonna be fucking great but guess what like five years down the road, it's not so great. You know, I don't think that it's something that can be sustained for a long period of time in a healthy way that you are going to get the needs met that you need to get met. So I think it's a a short term thing. But you know, I mean, maybe, maybe I am being a boomer about it, you know, like maybe the next generation will prove me wrong. But 
in my personal experience, like there's just no way. Well, how important is how important is a long term thing? Uh, I mean, what would you consider long term? And you know, my my way in which to move to the world has produced only one, seven, one, four, and one like three year relationship. Um, but all of those relationships were with different women, so. You know, I, I, you could argue very easily that, you know, my point of view, if my goal were a long term sustained partnership, I would have to give up a lot of things that I, I don't want to give up. Um, and so I wonder, like, for some people, if that just wouldn't be like, I just don't know that we're all the same. I mean, you know, and that we all want the same thing or we all need the same thing. Right. Like that. You know, I, I I appreciate when you're like, I don't think human beings are monogamous. I think some people are. Uh, I think some people have very little sex drive. And you know, as so as a as a man that's really really explored my own sexuality and been hypersexual and then you know almost asexual at times in my life, and. and put down the concern that I would have when my uh, sex drive would lower. I think that's only kicks in when you get a little older because you worry it's not going to come back, but that's just, that's just not true. Um, you know, there's been lots of times in my, my youth, that sort of thing where it's, it's come and it's gone. So my self-awareness and experience makes me very comfortable with that. But I, I think that, you know, some men aren't very comfortable with that because they've they haven't had the same types of experiences and the same type of exposure similarly most women have not had the types of experience and the type of exposure that you've had to you know such a, a large swath of men probably both very good and not great um and seen that the way they behaved and how they behaved out of that to make your own choices to how long a partnership you want so I, I don't know. I mean, do you think, I mean, is your goal a, 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 a forever? Well, I think that, cause I hear what you're saying that like for you and I, non-monogamy makes more sense. But I, I think that the general, especially world population is looking for monogamy because I think that while we want to go explore the world and, and learn about ourselves and do all these things, I think most people just want safety and they want to settle down and they want predictability and, I think those are like top priorities for people. Um, do, like, do you think the way you look has opened it up for you in a way that if you, you know, looked differently, uh, you know, you'd be like, well, I guess this is the best I can do. You know, that I need to settle down. Like I ain't getting any younger and I definitely I'm not getting any thinner. <laughs> so you know, I mine is, you, you, yeah. do you know what I mean? Like, and you're just like, Hey, this guy, he's into it. And like, that's something I would say I've had men tell me before they got divorced. I'm worried. I'll never have sex again. That's never panned out. They've always <laughs> had sex again, but they had yeah. those thoughts. I would say that in my twenties that that would have definitely been a mind mindset shift. If I look different, because one of my favorite things to do would be like travel the world solo because I know that I would like, I'd meet some guy in a bar and he'd let me stay with him that night. Like I, I, I knew that was going to happen, you know, <laughs> like there was this like sense of adventure. I, yeah. Right. Like, and I got so much value. I needed, I love that affirmation of myself. Now I'm, I've done so much self exploration and love and spent alone time to know that that would no longer be why I would be traveling. Like I don't need to go sit at bars by myself anymore to get validation from men. Um, I'm sober now. So um, I don't use drugs and alcohol to get these like quick fixes. It's like, I am fine sitting in silence by myself. The, the reason I would go travel now is to go sightseeing. I mean, obviously I was still sightseeing, but you know, always like looking around and see who was looking at me. Um, it's a different site. So yeah, different site. So, um, I would say that in my twenties, yeah, I would have been like, Oh fuck, I need to settle down because this is the best I can do. Um, which again, I think so many people rush into it, you know, all my, my nieces have already been married, you know, they're obviously younger than me than my nieces that, you know, married at least once and have kids, you know, and they're barely, they're just barely out of their teens or whatever. And 
um, just because that's how it is down there. And I think that is more what it's like all over the world than like our experience. I would agree. But I think our experience is the road less traveled, yeah. uh, you know, and even though it's not what Robert Frost was saying, you know, the, 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 the process to, to, and the, the privilege to be able to say, I'm going to strike out on my own. Uh, you have to have something, some sort of belief or some sort of experience in your life that gives you the freedom and the belief that you can strike out on your own, right? I mean, not everybody's smart. You know, one of the things that I think was probably significantly and consistently underestimated by those that were around you were, you know, you're real smart. And so, you know, my, my guess is people have underestimated that in you more than once. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but, but it's true. And, um, you know, you, you're again, as I, I'm reiterating, you're living a life that I, it looks as if you're very conscientious about the choices you make. And even though some people might not understand them, they're, they're choices that you're, you're like, these are the good things. These are the bad things. That's kind of why I asked you a question about like, what if it were objectively proven like cigarettes, like, oh man, you know, this much screen time, you know, shortened your life by like 20 years. You're like, oh, I guess I got it. I mean, would that would that affect what you were doing now? Yeah, I mean, I definitely. Try I mean, that's a dramatic yeah. ex example. I mean, you know I definitely try trying to take to in all of the information, you know, and then make an educated decision about it. But I'm so glad you brought up the the conscious decision making because I think that's one of the like the biggest compliment that people give me is that I work hard, you know, and um like over looks, over being smart or whatever. Like I love it when people see that I work hard. That means a lot for me. I know I do derive a lot of self-worth from that, which is probably not great. But um, <laughs> but so yeah, the, like the way that I've been able to, yeah, travel or live here in LA or, you know, pursue acting or whatever is because like of all these sacrifices and yeah, like s saying no to things or saying yes to things that were hard and curating this life, like this life wasn't just like handed to us, right? Like we had to break out of boxes left and right to kind of get to where we're at. Um, and so many times, I don't know, I just have a conversation with somebody that has kids, you know, and they're like, oh, you're so lucky you never had kids. Like, yeah, I, I'm not lucky I made that decision, you know? Um, anyway, I just have a lot of like, I hold that so dear to my heart that, that we worked so hard to get like where we're at now. And now we do have opportunities or you know just I just feel so happy in my life and and that came with a lot of hard work and self-work and sacrifices and probably a lot of unhappiness yeah, yeah both of us are uh, big fans of the vasectomy <laughs> yeah we, we, we've high-fived on that more than yeah. once uh yeah I, I think they're, they're, they're great I think more men should do them and I think it's a it's it's a testament to uh the sh shallow, vulnerable, insecure masculinity that is the reason that that's not more popular. Yeah. It just I also wish people just didn't use kids as a way to fix things like, oh, I'm bored, I'll have a kid, or I don't know what to do with my – I feel like so many people have children out of not having a purpose, right? You hear that all the time, like, my kid gave me purpose. My kid taught me how to do this. But like, what? If, how much awesomer would it be if you had learned those things, found your purpose, and then had a kid? But not hating on anybody's choices, obviously. Uh, uh, no, I, I, I totally agree. I, I think I, I saw a comment once where someone was, was saying, you know, having kids is the easiest way to give your life purpose and meaning. And, and, and I was like, I think the person that should derive purpose from the relationship between a parent and a child is the child. I think it's the parent that should validate the child's purpose, not the other way around. And I think that's a very, very specific type of human. I think they exist. I don't think I'm one of them specifically, but um, I do think they exist. And I think that's okay. Like, again, it's this notion that we, 
as we talked about before, like the, the podcasts that are like, men suck and women are awful. They're coming out from such a simple minded point of view. And I think as the point of view is expanding more and more, it's really, really challenging people's foundation of belief about what happiness looks like. And, you know, like you and I were given a, a ladder to happiness, a very specific one. And we were both like, I don't think I'm going to climb that ladder. Which ladder are you going to climb? I don't know, but this cliff looks fun. <laughs> Woo, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> let's see what's at the bottom of this hole. Um, uh, and then you crawl out of it. You'd be like, so there was, there was nothing, nothing down good. that hole. Uh, but this one looks super promising. So here we go. Um, you know, and everybody's like, well, I'm going to stay on the ladder. And then sooner or later, you know, you, something happens and it's, you know, you, you do find something at the bottom of that hole and you shoot to the top, you know, and you, you're really enjoying your experience and it was hard, but you also look back and you, like, I had a great time learning. Not always. There were, there were times that did not have a great time, but you know, the, the, those are fewer than the times that were really amazing. And you know, to your point, when I look at some of my friends, I look at some of my friends that love having kids. They love being a parent and they're, they're, they look, they're happy as they can be. You know what I mean? They're, they're like, this is it. This is the bee's knees for me. My, my kid is everything to me. And, and that's just the way it is. I don't want to do anything else. And I think that's, they, I'm like, I'm so glad you actually had kids. It's the ones that complain that say, Oh, I'm so jealous and envious of your life. It's like because you fucked it up and you had kids. You shouldn't have done that. It wasn't necessary. And you're probably being a bad parent. I like I, I have this this theory that, you know, like if you can boil life down to like three things your personal life, your professional life, and your person and your family life. And your personal adventure and your career can go really well together, which is like what you have right? Or your career and your family life can go really well together. But unless you're a trust fund kid, you can't do the personal life and the family life, right? And Because you can only do two of those things really well. If you try and do all three, you're probably going to be bad at all of them. And I know that's a very simplistic model, but like, I've just never seen somebody that was actually doing a great job. They, they might for a while look like it, but then it's like, Oh, my kid's 20 and, um, you know, it's his third rehab mm. or, you know, my, yeah. you know what I mean? And it's like, I thought I was doing a good job, but apparently the lessons that they needed were not given and now they don't know what to do and they're self-destructing. Um, and, you know, if your kid's 20 and in that position, it's, <laughs> I hate to say it, it's probably the parent's fault. Uh, that doesn't mean they were bad people, but they just didn't do a good job, probably because they were concerned about their personal adventure and going countries and wanting to know what it's like to sit in a bar and not have a reservation. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, I've done that too. Like it's super empowering. It's really fun. It's exciting all the way through, you know? Right. I mean, it's, it was yeah. a thrill ride. I'm, yeah, I'm guessing definitely. like, like you kind of knew it was going to happen like you felt confident or you, you wouldn't be this all in, but at the same time, you know, I, I don't, I mean, you probably never did, but I definitely had at least one or two nights where I was like, and that didn't work. For sure. No, there were lots me. of not work, uh, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're like, that is uh failed here. Um, and so I guess, you know, that happened one night in Paris. I slept in, I slept on the street of thieves in front of Notre Dame because I couldn't get a hostel because I, I didn't plan it. And I went to a bar and I tried and I didn't speak French. It was my first night. And I was like, well, here we yeah. go. Um, I didn't realize it was the street of thieves, but yeah. So is there anything else you want to add? Like I, 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 your point of view is, is really interesting. Your perspective on your experience is really fascinating on 
what you've seen that, that others haven't and how you see the world, regardless of whether people agree or not, is not really important. It's more of a, this is a legitimate perspective um, by someone that's probably seen more variety of things than the average human being, mm -hmm. I would say. Yeah, I'd right? say so. Uh, good and bad. Yeah, good and bad. You've probably seen a larger average. So, like, from a from a feminine point of view, you know, how, how much would you say you are divided between femininity and masculinity? Hmm, I feel like, uh, well, one, I feel like it shifts depending on the situation. Um, hmm. You know, I would say when I, like, feel safe or could like let like when my guard comes up it's more masculine right like the way I talk the way I dress um you know I got robbed in south central when I first moved here at knife point in broad daylight because I was wearing a little sundress and wedges so now baby girl doesn't walk around like that you know like I wear a hoodie and I like walk all tough or whatever but um you know that just depends but um but I would say oh gosh I don't know like percentage wise I, I guess more feminine for sure. Maybe like maybe like sixty four maybe seventy thirty, seventy percent feminine energy. Because I feel like the same way that people mm -hmm. feel comfortable with you and tell you their story, like men, I feel like I bring that out in people. But I feel like it's a feminine energy, like of knowing like, hey, like you're in a safe space and I would love to listen to you. I think mine's a feminine energy oh, too. Okay. Yeah. Well, what is your percentage of masculine? Yeah, I think that's what does. What it. is your percentage? I think I'm I'm fairly I think I'm fairly generally fifty fifty probably plus or minus sixty forty uh you know one way or the other ten percent mm -hmm. right is is needed but I think for me generally um, I I think of masculine and femininity as kind of a way of thinking a uh, way of representing and or behaving in the world and there are aspects to me that are more masculine uh, than feminine and ma aspects to me that are more feminine than masculine. I think if you take them all put together, for me, it's probably closer to 50-50, but, you know, the way I dress has a, has a you know, hyper-masculine experience with these touches of uh, decoration, which is traditionally a feminine expression, but to your point, it's not really a feminine presentation that I get my nails painted. I, I don't get them painted. I paint them myself, but you know, I, I, I like when it's chipped and it's like still like, it's still funky. Like, you know, and I even had a guy the other day say, Oh, you got to redo your nails. I was like, I don't actually, this is, this is, this is the thing, right? Yes. When I paint them, I paint them, you know, tail to tip, but when it starts to fade, that's like, that's the actual expression that mm -hmm. I'm going for. I just don't want to sit here and chip it out and make it intentionally look like it's chipped. Like I just like buying ripped jeans already ripped. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I just paint the nails and they, they rip themselves and that, you know, like my hair is a little longer. I cut it off and then cut it into an awkward phase. <laughs> so now I've got to wait. <laughs> But, you know, that that for me has, has a pretty masculine approach. But I feel like the way that I, to your point, like people open up to me and they, they, they talk to me and, and you know, Uber drivers, Lyft drivers, I'm always hearing their life stories. Uh, I've got headphones in and, and they're still telling me about their, their kid or their, their this and that. Um, and... You know, I think that's because, you know, the, to your point, like people feel safe. Uh, so I think that is a feminine energy. That's, that's a feminine way of thinking, of engaging into the world. Where, where do you think you've been successfully masculine? Uh, I feel like my masculinity, like, protects me. Um, like, I feel like... Um, Yeah, like a, like archetypally, like I have a knight um, and I just feel like 
that keeps me safe and like keeps me right because you can't walk around vulnerable all the time so I feel like that is the armor that I put on when I need to you know make business phone calls or walk down the street or um, when I'm going through a breakup or whatever so I feel like that Mm -hmm. you know more of a masculine way of yeah that's interesting yeah I think that's uh I mean, I think that's great. There's really no commentary on that experience. It's just that's your experience. Yeah. Um, I think there's there's more to, more of that, or should be more of that, uh, rather than a critique of everyone's experience. Just a acknowledgement that like people are just having really different times out here. Like my world is super different from yours, and our world is super different than a lot of people, and that has that, that's just real. You know, your, your experiences are different. You're going to engage in the world in different ways. Um, you want different things than others want. And uh, I, I always see this, this movement to, again, like find validity or, or validation in like getting others to agree with your point of view or that your experience has valid when we all should just be like, yes, your experience is valid because it is your experience. But starting to understand how many different experiences we're having is helping, I think, give rise to this 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 culture that is a lot more accepting, right? And a lot more considerate, like you're seeing in LA, which I know maybe it's passe to say the United States is at the tip of the spear on this thing because it always wants to project itself as a world leader. But right now, uh, I would argue it is, right? I think gender fluidity and these things are going to come to Europe. They're going to, and, and they're five, seven years behind, mm-hmm. I think. You know, it's going to come to these places, but it's not here yet. But what's happening in LA is, spreading and i think that's why you're seeing the big backlash to it too because you know people can see it spreading and you know woe is be the world where everybody's making an active choice not to be a dick. <laughs> <For sure>. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah that sounds like a terrible world i definitely don't want to live in it um <laughs> but thank you so much like your your again your your perspective is is really unique uh, and the way that you see yourself, right? Because that, that's something that's really important to me is the, the self-awareness. I think that's kind of step one. And so everybody that I, I talk to here, you know, I think anyway, has a, has like a fairly high level of self-awareness. And I think that's otherwise it's it's not really worth the conversation, sure. to be honest. You know, like you have to start with self because you can tell your story about how you got to where you got and why you made the choices intentionally that you made but like if you're not self-aware about what you actually want you're just going to be really unhappy potentially because you're just shooting in the dark or doing what somebody told you to do or doing what you thought was right because somebody told you to do it when you were very young and uh, i think it's interesting that you made the same choices given all of your background to to take on the world in a very different way thank you so uh so I really thank you for being here. Um, do you have any 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 last words before we? Mm, we thanks wrap for up? letting me share part of my story and my experiences, and uh, this was super fun. Yeah, this was uh, this is just a, a, an a cuff cuff episode, saying it's not really pointed in one direction or not. It's really more about you and you know your your life and your experiences and and. Uh, these little Easter eggs, I think, are are an interesting part of this Sex and Humans podcast experience that I'm, I'm trying to create. So uh, I really thank you for being on it. It's uh, it's very validating. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, I, and I appreciate you guys for listening. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cody. Thank you for listening to the Sex and Humans podcast. My name is John David Will. Powered by Riverside FM, edited with Autopod.